Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Kao, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. I'm here with Dr. Rafael Campo, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and JAMA's poetry section editor. Dr. Campo's poetry and essays have appeared in publications including American Poetry Review, the New York Times, and Scientific American. We will be talking about the healing value of poetry during this COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Campo, thank you for being a guest on Ethics Talk today. It's my pleasure, Adi. Thank you so much for having me. So as a physician poet, you believe that words matter and that poetry can make physicians better at their craft. Can you share with our audience what you mean by that? Sure. I think, you know, poetry has such an important role in the work of, of healing. And, and there are many ways I, I think uh, it, it is important to us as, as physicians, as healers. Perhaps the most important way has to do with uh, how poetry really uh, models empathy, how it really invites us into the experience of another person through immersion, really, in another voice. And my own experience, really, of, of clinical medicine, working with patients, seeing patients in the office, is really uh, an experience of, of poetry. I find that, you know, like the clinical encounter, a poem really uh, asks that I be present in a way that uh, makes me much more attentive, makes me a much better listener, makes me more uh, present for, for my patients. And, and, and also I think, you know, poetry has a wonderful way of, of allowing us to uh, become witnesses, to be, to be uh, when, when perhaps we would wish to look away to avert our gaze, to really, to really be present in the experience of suffering or grief or, or any of the kinds of uh, difficult uh, emotions or, or uh, experiences that our, our patients bring to us uh, in, in, in clinical medicine. So uh, I think that's probably the most important way it's, it's, it's helpful that it's important for us. I think also poetry really uh, is able to accommodate a diversity of voices and you know, uh, through, through uh, expressing uh, so many diverse perspectives, so many uh, ways of knowing about the experience of illness, uh, it, it teaches us really cultural humility. It allows us to really uh, see our own selves, of course, mirrored in, in the experience of another person and another voice, but at the same time uh, to learn about uh, different distinct experiences of of suffering of uh, of of how we might uh, term the social determinants of disease uh, really impact on on illness and on healing and then perhaps you know one other way that uh, is important perhaps to mention is that you know in poetry you know it there there's no, there's no certainties like we like to think there are in medicine. You know, uh, poetry really presents uh, a kind of uh, uncertain view of of uh, of an experience. There's no right or wrong answer. And when I teach poetry to my medical students, when I share it with physician colleagues, and and even with patients, one of the most important uh, ways we approach it is to begin by recognizing that, that there isn't going to be a right answer necessarily. It's really more of an invitation to shared experience. And, and, and again, for, for docs who are accustomed always to thinking in, in, in very certain terms, in terms of data, in terms of you know, uh, uh, outcome measures, uh, uh, we need something uh, in our practice of, of medicine, in the art of medicine, that allows us to be more really comfortable with uncertainty. So those are the, probably the three main ways I see uh, poetry as, as uh, really uh, important and, and really a kind of deep expression of, of the work of healing. Yeah, I mean, in reflecting on what you just said, it's uh, somewhat ironic to be talking about being present with your patient during an encounter when we're in a pandemic where mm. physical distancing is expected from all of us. Uh, as someone who directs the literature and writing program 
at Harvard Medical School. Uh, how do you think the shared collective experience of prolonged separation and isolation will affect how poetry can be used to engage a wider, sometimes uh, skeptical audience of students and clinicians? Well, that's a really good question, Adi. I think that, you know, in many ways, what I'm seeing and experiencing is how this social distancing and physical distancing really is a kind of uh, almost exaggeration of the distancing that we uh, see modeled for us during our medical training. And so, uh, so, so it's particularly uh, problematic, I think, for us as, as physicians to now be required in some senses to, yeah. to be physically distanced uh, from, from our patients, from, from one another. And so, so I think, you know, ironically, you know, doctors are sensitive to this issue from the experiences they've had during their training. And it's actually led to, I think, more of a craving, if you will, a kind of, you know, need, a kind of demand for language, a kind of, you know, an urgency around we need to you know, we need to connect. We need to yeah. overcome these barriers that we're finding uh, in in the clinics, uh, on the wards, uh, and even in our in our family lives, in our in our social lives. Uh, and so, so uh, you know, for example, as as uh, a poetry section editor for JAMA, I'm seeing you know a huge increase in the number of of poems that are coming in. Uh, almost all of which are responding in one way or another to to the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, so it's really striking to me how, how, yes, we are frustrated, we are, you know, burned out, we are dealing with, you know, uh, ever more distancing that's, you know, very strictly enforced uh, in our, in our professional lives and in our, in our home lives. But yet we, we still crave that human connection. And so I think it's really actually leading to more, more of us seeking out poems, seeking out art, seeking out uh, the ways in which we can still connect with one another and, and have that meaningful human empathetic connection. Uh, and I think, you know, in particular, you know, at the end of life where many of our patients are, are separated and isolated from loved ones uh, as, they, as they face that, 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 last, that last minute, that last moment of life, uh, that really, calls us to to yeah. to speak to language so so i think it's really uh in some ways again uh only increased the uh interest and in, and uh need for for poetry and for language yeah i wouldn't call it a silver lining of this pandemic but i think you're right that given that so many of us in our personal and professional lives are experiencing uh isolation not being present with others that uh the the healing value of poetry seems much more acute and poignant now than ever before. Yes, yes, I think you're right, Audie, absolutely. That's certainly been my experience, yeah. So i like to now turn our attention to some of your poetry, a couple of which uh, were written during this pandemic and one that was written earlier. So can we start by asking you to read the poem entitled Virology? Sure, sure. Uh, so this is a poem called Virology. One, 1970. They wanted me to get the chicken pox, so mommy brought me over to the neighbors to play with Clara. Clara had red hair and red spots covering her face. We stripped her Barbies down to bare skin, scared to see their lack of imperfections, breasts smooth domes, and not a thing between their plastic legs. I felt sick afterwards, but no rash appeared. Ashamed of failing at contagion, I locked myself in my closet back at home, the dark touching me all over like death. Two, 1990. Y'all can't get it from just a kiss, he said. He leaned across the table, took a bite of my dessert and smiled. He smelled of smoke and cinnamon. Since he was going blind, I helped him paint his nails scarlet. Y'all's just paranoid, he said, another cough erupting like a counter argument to breath. Soul food was his specialty, 
red beans, collards, sweet potato pie, tea. Like the new virus, I was ravenous. His kiss, sweet Jesus, still tastes of the divine. 3. 2020. The president is on TV again. He says it's over, like it hasn't begun. All this started again because of what we want. That movie with the slow-mo bullet we dodge. The song my parents dance to in the kitchen, night after night. Bright stars so limitless, we yearn to travel there. We even want this virus, telling us again that masks won't really save us now. It's much too late for hoarding. What we want more than anything is to be this lost again. Well, I certainly appreciate that reading. Uh, I know that you did your residency uh, in one of those time periods, the second time period that you mentioned, which was during the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. So uh, what commonalities and differences were you trying to illuminate uh, among these three viral time periods? Yeah, so that's a, another great question, Adi. I think uh, probably the most uh, important commonality I was trying to uh, uh, illuminate uh, has to do with stigma uh, and the stigma associated with uh, with disease, with with right. uh, with contagion, uh, particularly with uh, viral illness uh, such as HIV and and, and certainly uh, COVID nineteen now. And and uh, I certainly remember very distinctly during my uh, experiences uh, as a as a house officer during the height of the AIDS uh, crisis in San Francisco how that stigma really played out in terms of the care uh, and lack of care or uh, avoidance of care that we uh, provided to our patients then. And so, uh, and so uh, in a way, I think you know, poetry uh, not only honors and, and helps us to remember uh, those uh, times and, and, and uh, the people who, uh, who died uh, for lack of treatment and for lack of care, uh, and who are still dying in many parts of the world, uh, similarly for uh, lack of access to care because of the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS, and so, uh, so I think you know that that's again another function perhaps of of poetry. One of the things that it it can do is it can help us to remember and it can uh, help us to combat the silences around stigmas that uh, can lead to uh, inequities in care. And and I I, I always remember. Uh, uh, the the activists, uh, the people you know, marching in the streets of San Francisco, uh, saying "silence equals death," chanting "silence silence equals death," and and how their voices, how their courage, uh, their uh, willingness to tell their stories, to not be silenced, uh, and wow. sometimes that was in the form of poetry. Sometimes that was in the form of uh, you know, kind of poetic activism. And, and that activism you know, saved lives. That activism did lead to uh, advances in, in HIV care and treatment that you know, now allow us to uh, treat patients with HIV and, and, and prolong life. And so, so you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, poetry, what does it really have to do with medicine? And you know, in some ways, it's, it, it very practically impacts on, on on the practice of medicine and and uh, and advances in in science uh, uh, medical science and so so that's uh, one one of the commonalities uh, certainly yeah. we see you know stigma related to COVID nineteen now and you know our president calling you know the disease kung flu uh, you know yeah. these kinds of ways of pointing the finger at at uh, uh, others who are somehow. Uh, uh, to be blamed for for infecting us, for for spreading the disease, for spreading the virus, and this is a, a trope that goes back over many uh, plagues, over many histories sure. of of, of uh, human disease, and so uh, so this is unfortunately not uh, something new, but it's uh, but it's uh, the fact that it continues to be repeated. I think you know uh, again reminds us that we need to you know, we need to uh, speak up. We need to. Uh, you know, tell our stories. We need to, you know, uh, 
call uh, one another to you know our best selves and 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 resist these kinds of stereotypes and these you know uh, uh, you know attempts at uh, pointing fingers and, and laying blame and so so that was perhaps one of the most important uh, yeah. commonalities I was trying to illustrate uh, in this uh, in this uh, poem. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I would say as a, as a, I'm not sure I would call myself a science fiction geek, but I have seen many <laughs> science fiction TV shows and movies where, you know, invariably there's some dimension of time travel that comes into play. <laughs> yes. And I think that, you know, having also done my, uh, my house dad training at the same time that basically you did, I think poetry can really kind of teleport you back yes in many ways to a time in your life that uh you may have forgotten and i think you know words and poetry can 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 play that kind of science fiction function almost of teleporting across time yes yes i think that's true we do move through time and move through histories uh when we engage poetry and, and other forms of 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 art and and other yeah. humanity kinds of uh uh, discourses or materials, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So now this next poem entitled Unexceptional is one that you wrote before the pandemic. Could you yeah. read uh, some of it for our audience? Yes. Unexceptional. Except we're, we were in love, or so it seemed. The refugees kept streaming past. The cops kept shooting up the neighborhood. Except it seemed that we were happy, pulled the shades and set aside our textbooks, brushed our teeth. The honor killings went unpunished while we aged together, holding hands as we succumbed to sleep. It seemed that life was good, except black mothers kept on dying young. We said our vows in church, and afterwards it seemed that queers were harmless, even mattered. The loved ones ones in our photograph gave back at us, at, our, at each other, or beyond, except the virus struck, the pipeline burst, the hurricane made landfall, killing thousands. Yeah, that's a, a very uh, powerful segment of your uh, poem there, and it seems to speak to many of the the uh, social fractures, including racial inequities that have been amplified by this uh, pandemic. That being said, you know, what is the role and power of words at a time when many are asking for more walk and frankly, less talk? Yeah. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I mean, I do think that that you know, poetry is a form of walk and talk. Actually, I think that uh, poetry that that speaks to uh, social justice concerns that that tries to uh, you know respond to what we sometimes again sort of more abstractly uh, uh, and and perhaps facilely think of you know social determinants of disease and really calls these things out for what they are. That, uh, that this these are. Uh, uh, the, that, that some of the inequities we see in healthcare in this country are really the direct cause of racism. They are the direct cause of other forms of discrimination that, that harm people and that lead to people dying. And, and so, uh, so I think that, you know, really the best poetry, you know, does call us to action. It does ask us to walk the walk. It, it, it demands that we not only speak, but that we, get out into the streets like those AIDS activists did, like we see the Black Lives Matter activists uh, doing now, and, and change our society, change our culture, and, and walk that walk, do what we need to do to make change. Because uh, the kind of more abstract approach that uh, sometimes we adopt uh, in medicine by uh, looking at statistics and uh, which again are important. We need to uh, characterize and quantify, you know, what is happening as a consequence of these social forces. But, but, but frankly, I think that's not enough. We need to be, a, we need to put ourselves in some sense at risk. We are healers. We swear an oath to heal, to put ourselves in the way of harm when our patients need us. And, this is, uh, uh, I think, again, what, what poetry really uh, asks us to do. When I, when I share poems with my medical students, 
you know, uh, as part of a, a health disparities uh, curriculum, you know, uh, we, we often talk about sort of the nuts and bolts and the statistics and, and you know, inevitably there are, are uh, folks whose eyes are sort of glazing over, you know, it's all numbers, it's all, you know, distance, it's another form of distancing in, in many respects. But when we read a poem by, by Audre Lorde or by, by uh, Marilyn Hack or by, or by Martina Spada, writers who have, again, uh, taken these uh, uh, st- statistics and, and humanized them and, and oh. narrated them and, 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 and illustrated really how these things that we study actually harm people. Uh, it, it's transformative. It changes how we, we think about these kinds of uh, problems and, yeah. it, and it inspires people to act. Yeah, no, I appreciate your, your, your thoughts about uh, that. It's both talk and walk. And I think the HIV AIDS experience is a very tangible example of that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So now this last poem was also written by you recently. Uh, Would you mind reading this last poem for our audience? Sure. This is a poem called The Doctor's Song. The ventilators rise and fall. The ambulances siren call. The blue gowns rustle down the hall. They page us and we go. The wail of loved ones. Silence then, until the next alarm, a pulsatile bleat, almost like an infant's cry. A team in baggy scrubs slogs by. The coughing, like a symphony a virus might conduct. We listen, as if the breath sounds might not lessen. As if the body we are given protected us. The stethoscope won't be an instrument of hope. It merely amplifies the gallop, makes audible the failing heart. The doctor's song is not heroic. Sing like the needle, sing like hurt. Yeah. You know, in in reflecting on, on this last poem, I can't help but think of how our colleagues in the front lines of care during this COVID-19 pandemic are experiencing great stress and uncertainties. So can you offer some advice on how poetry can help frontline clinicians deal with their uh, moral distress and burnout? Yes, yes, I think very much so, Adi. I think that, that poems you know, really are at the, at the basis of our humanity. They really speak to us from, from the depths of our souls. And, and, and you know, what, what a lot of us are confronting, uh, especially our colleagues who are really you know, on the front lines of medicine, is this kind of you know, existential grief, this, this you know, loss, confronting the, the loss of life, confronting uh, the suffering of, of, of people we wish we could help and yet are, are, are limited by the the medicine that we have which is insufficient uh and so what do we have to offer uh patients and and to one one another ourselves uh when we're when we're in that place and i think what we have to offer is again uh witnessing of the human condition you know the way that poetry you know tells us and reassures us that you know we are together joined together always in the uh really the terrible splendor of the human condition. And there's something heartening in that. There's something about being uh, together in our mortality. Uh, none of us lives forever. Uh, none of us uh, uh, is going to you know, uh, conquer uh, death ultimately. Uh, and so what poetry, I think, helps us to, to do and helps us to realize is that that's part of being human and that what we can offer always is our, our human heart, our empathy, our care, our compassion, our presence, uh, warming someone's hand uh, as they're dying in the ICU, uh, yeah. just uh, uh, sharing last words. If it's just uh, even, even through you know, some of these technological uh, 
uh, innovations that we do have uh, via an iPad or uh, uh, you know, these are ways that we can still connect humanly and that is invaluable and that's what I would I would say you know uh, poetry always uh, reminds me of is is you know that that shared humanity and that to me that's really the 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 deepest kind of comfort uh that that you know touches me really in my soul and um and i think that's uh again uh, that gives meaning to what we do as 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 healers uh when we look for meaning in 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 just the technology and just the cure and just the you know the successful intervention uh i think that's where we you know are really at, m at most risk of 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 that kind of uh, burnout, that kind of um, hopelessness, that kind of despair, but but poetry reminds us that there is something more uh, beyond you know uh, the cure, uh, and that's healing. That's healing in the the very broadest uh, and uh, most meaningful sense, uh, and that is that is comforting, and that is uh, I think that's how we get through this ultimately, all of us together. Well, on that uh, promising note, I want to thank Dr. Rafael Campo for sharing his poetic insights with our audience today. Dr. Campo, thank you for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Thank you so much for having me again, Audie. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. And to our viewing audience out there, Corona doesn't know or care. I may not know you, but do care. Don your mask, wash your hands, stay apart until we can be together again. Be well and be safe. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk. <laughs>